friends. Very good, though. Professor of Translation Studies at Zurich University, to whom I also want to thank for having come down and forming part of this panel. And finally, myself, Professor Frederick Chaume, Chairman of the panel today <coughs> from Universidad de Primer, Castillo de la Plana, a few kilometers down there. The candidate will have approximately between 20 and 30 minutes, and there is no limit according to regulations, but we would appreciate if you could speak for, say, 20 30 minutes to present uh, your case research, and afterwards, uh, the members of the panel will ask some questions and address some suggestions to the candidates about both his thesis, your thesis, and your presentation. Then the candidate will have the possibility to answer each member one by one, or simply answer all of us at the end of our three turns all together. We've been speaking about this before, and if you agree, we would appreciate if you could answer us one by one. Perfect. Like, more, more like in the British style rather than the Spanish style, right? The research and the examination, the candidate's thesis, opts to the award of an international doctorate. Right. <clears throat> and uh, finally, a final word for the candidate. Remember that although you are in a viva, uh, which is maybe one of the most important and rewarding acts of, of academia, in academia, this is also a special day for you, a special day for your family, and a special day for your friends as well. Therefore, in addition to keeping uh, your adrenaline high, to high levels and to observing the rules as well, try to enjoy this day because today will be a day to remember for you. Okay then, uh, now Mr. David Rego, please start your presentation. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And Buenos días a todos, muchas gracias por venir. Thank you, the tribunal, for coming. So I'm going to start with the presentation of my piece, which, as has been mentioned, is, typed, is entitled The Reception of Non-Professional Subtitling. Uh, I will provide the overview of the piece and visit the results and the complementary findings in order to open the floor for the following discussion. I will present the introduction, the theoretical and methodological frameworks of my work, the results, and <coughs> then conclude with the limitations and further research of my work. My research, as has been mentioned, is part of non-professional subtitling. It's about non-professional subtitling. Non-professional subtitling is part of a more general phenomenon that is occurring nowadays. Users, consumers of the visual content, are taking the power that firstly remained with the producers and are in charge of distributions or taking over distribution channels. And in order to do this, in order to overcome linguistic barriers, these people have organized themselves in communities that produce subtitles in different languages. So the flow of content is uh, pretty much random, depending on the groups and how they organize themselves. The colors here are just for uh, illustrative purposes, it doesn't have any meaning. Uh, so in my case, I'm studying how products, or the visual products from the United States, are translated uh, how how non-professional translated products are used in Spain, but I include two different types of subtitles: Siberian non-professional subtitles and Latin American <coughs> Latin American non-professional subtitles. This research comes to complement the previous studies on non-professional subtitles and fine solving, not only in not in translation studies but also in a wider framework. Non-professional subtitling started as part of uh, the fandom community. Uh, it was initially dealing with the translation of anime from Japan into the United States, and then, due to the technological advancements and the popularity of American television, mainly, but also to the growth of other uh, media industries it started to have an impact on other areas too. So translation studies it starts to pay attention to non-professional subtitling pretty much the last decade. And so far we have studied the production conditions of the subtitles, the subtitles as such, the people in church of making the subtitles, and specific aspects such as 
how these subtitles come to be, why they exist, as censorship, for instance, and how they are created. So how these uh, participatory and co-creational practices are put in place in order to produce the subtitles and to get the subtitles to the target audience. And lately we have also been discussing how non-professional subtitling changes depending on the environment and how this is affecting uh, the translation profession and the consumption of um, and the consumption of and distribution of translations. Sorry. However, up to now, or at least when I started my thesis, the um, reception of these products, how people are actually using these subtitles, and whether these subtitles are um, useful or not for the people, was still uh, pretty much an uncharted territory. We didn't we didn't know what people think about the subtitles, or uh, how were these subtitles um, being received by the audience. So that is the question that I set off to answer. Taking this into account, I started to look at reception studies within translation studies. And as it happens, reception has been pointed out as an important topic in translation, but the empirical research in, in, on reception is made of very few studies. As of, now, as of today, still. although we have more and more studies, especially in audiovisual translation, we don't know much about how people are using the translations. So this uh, was one of the questions I wanted to, to answer with my study, and I um, based my, my, the design of my, of my study on what, what Gambier has proposed about how should reception be studied. So he says we should uh, include the three R's, that is, the reactions and responses of the audience and the repercussions that the translated product have on the audience. So by analyzing these three aspects, we could provide a more general panorama of how reception is, uh, how translation is received and by the audience. This becomes, studying reception becomes especially important in a context in which audiences are changing, as I have mentioned before, they are taking over the distribution roles, they are accessing more and more content from many different places, and also these audiences are not what used to be considered the, the, like the totally foreign audience. A lot of people are saying this now, their translation does no longer occur from a totally foreign language into the modern tongue, but also from a language that is to some degree familiar to the users. So users have some knowledge of the source language, and within this panorama, especially when talking about English, uh, users have different resources and a different way to face the translation. So this comes also to alter the design of my, of my study. I want to see how users use different types of non-professional subtitling and professional subtitling, and whether their knowledge of the source language affects the way in which they receive the content. In order to answer, uh, to find some answers to these questions, I proposed three main hypotheses. Uh, the first one is related to the fact that participants uh, or viewers would have higher comprehension scores with a professional rather than with the non-professional translations, and this is grounded on the fact that uh, non-professional subtitling has been mostly judged as having low quality from a translation point of view. So I want to see if that holds using empirical data. The second sub hypothesis is related to the, the sorry, the second hypothesis is related to the language level. So how people with different levels of proficiency in the source language interact with the audiovisual content and how they may interact with the subtitles specifically. And the third one, and this is related to the differences I mentioned before in the different types of non-professional subtitling, I want to see how, in this case, people from Spain engages with professional and non-professional with professional sorry with non-professional subtitling produced in Spain and Latin America. Having these two varieties, how that affects the process of engaging with the subtitles. So, in order to put these hypotheses to test, I define I put my population as young people between 18 and 30 years. 30 year old university students, all of them, uh, with different levels of proficiency in English, uh, people with a high and a low level of English, and excluding the middle group. 
and then people who are users of the visual content because I want to see how people in their everyday lives actually use the content and like other studies that have uh, tried to see how people under fully dependent conditions on the translations interact with the content with the content regarding the material and for the same reasons I decided to include in my study a very popular TV series as Big Bang Theory and then regarding the subtitles I include three different types of subtitles the professional version distributed with a DVD copy uh, produced in Spain I use the DVD subtitles because talking about DVDs it's more likely that people in this context will, uh, will access D uh, subtitles through the DVD rather than with open television and then I include the two non-professional subtitles uh, version, subtitle versions one produced in Argentina by a group that translates into neutral Spanish this is the Latin American version that I call and then the Iberian version produced by a subtitling group uh, based in Spain, Grupo TS the subtitles were produced at the time when the uh, episodes were released in the United States so that's why I'm using the second season of the TV series in order to see how those subtitles were in order to see how um, no, sorry I use the second season of the TV series because that way I could access the DVD subtitles and I also could have the could be sure that these subtitles, non-professional ones have gone through the process of a community that is established and has been working for some time in order to collect the data, I combined three different methods at different stages. The first stage consists of an initial questionnaire aiming at the screening of the population in order to see how people are using audiovisual translation, how they are accessing the audiovisual content, which means they use, and also to classify the participants into the different groups that I was going to, to study, that is the low level, mid level, and high level of English groups. Then, in the second stage, I use eye tracking and questionnaires in order to see how people watch, at the, watch the subtitle uh, products, how they interact, how their attention shifts between the image and the subtitles. And then, there is after each clip during the experiment session, there is a questionnaire I, asking about their comprehension, how much they understand of the content, and what they think about the subtitles and the audiovisual content, the audiovisual experience in general. And then lastly, they have an interview to confirm the information collected during the initial questionnaire about their habits and then to ask them directly about their use of subtitling and non-professional subtitling and asking them about the possibility of identifying professional and non-professional subtitles when you don't know which one you're watching because until the interview the participants didn't know that they were watching a professional and non-professional subtitles in terms of participants, I had three, 332 respondents for the initial questionnaire that was uh, to explore the, the audiovisual consumption habits and to screen the population or to select the participants for the second stage in which I have 52 participants, 26 with a low level of English and 26 with a high level of English as you can see here in the low level of English group there is balance between the two uh, genders there are more or less equal number of male, male and females but then in the high level of English group maintaining this balance became more complicated on the one hand because the university population is made mostly of uh, women and on the second hand because women were more likely to have a high level of English so that's why that there is that in imbalance in the sample in the experimental design this here shows how participants were assigned to different orders of presentation for the videos each participant watched the three clips and each under one different subtitle condition and then I randomized the order of presentation of the subtitles but not the order of presentation of the clips so for instance the first participant let's say who has a low level of English group would watch clip one with a professional version clip two with the first non-professional version and clip 3 with a second non-professional version but this was different for uh, the other participants in the end I had nine different between 9 and 8 people in each group in order to do the analysis and 52 participants in total as mentioned before however due to eye tracking quality data I had to remove two participants 
completely from this experiment. Then two additional recordings for, were removed from two different participants also to try tracking data. And one additional participant was removed from the sample because during the interview session it became evident that this participant knew about the difference between professional and non-professional subtypes. So in order to avoid this from a um, bias, from introducing a bias in the result, I decided to remove this participant from the, from the data. To, in order to put the hypothesis to test, I use generalized and linear mixed regression models, and mixed effects models, sorry. Basically, I decided to use these models instead of traditional ANOVAs and T-tests because they, uh, they are able to account not only for the differences and the variations uh, between two different groups, but also within each group. And they can also offer, uh, during the data generation process, they offer a multi-level analysis. So um, a ranking is defined in order to analyze the predictor and how these predictors affect, affect the, the dependent variables. So that's why I decided to go with these methods. In all the cases, I used the controls at the beginning of the process. So I introduced gender uh, as a variable and also knowledge of the clip. And gender, knowledge of the clip, and also the variables that were under investigation, and then the variables were removed in the module as the module was refined in order to produce the final version. Regarding the first hypothesis, related to type of subtitles, ah, sorry, for each one of these hypotheses, I postulated several sub-hypotheses in order to test a specific relation between variables. So I'm going to present the results of each sub-hypothesis, and then continue with the with the final result for the three main hypotheses. So the first sub-hypotheses of uh, hypothesis one were related to self-reported measurements. That is how difficult people thought the subtitles were to follow, how difficult was it for them to follow the subtitles, and how much they think they understood from the content. In, uh, when testing this hypothesis, when testing these two sub-hypotheses, uh, it became evident that the type of subtitles did not play a significant role in the results. <coughs> also, the same happened for attention allocation and skipped subtitles. Attention allocation is the distribution of attention between the image of the, and the subtitles. And skipped subtitles are the subtitles that are left and read by the participants. Considering the type of subtitles here, uh, the results didn't show significant results for this, uh, for the, between the professional and the non-professional subtitles. However, when looking at other of the, of the dependent variables, <coughs> such as mean fixation duration, attention allocation, and reception capacity, there were differences that uh, depended on the type of subtitle. So for me, mean fixation duration, that is the average fixation, the average amount of time that a person fixates in a specific point on the screen, there were significant differences between the professional and the two non-professional versions, with the professional version being lower. I'm going to go back to this in a moment uh, to explain this effect in a more specific way. Mm. Interestingly enough, the mean fixation on the image between the professional and the second non-professional version did also vary significantly. In terms of attention shift ratio, that is, the ratio of movement strong back and forth the image and the subtitles that participants made. Professional version had a, had a significantly higher ratio than the two non-professional versions. But I will also go back to this in a moment because here some scholars suggest that having a lower ratio is the best option, but due to something I found, and I will explain later, I show that actually a two ratio would be like would probably be the most the indicator of a smoother reading process in case of subtitled products. Lastly, for reception capacity, that is how participants performed in the questionnaires after watching the clips in terms of a narrative, iconic, and verbal attention, and general comprehension, I found a significant difference between the professional, between the second non-professional version and the two other versions. So the second non-professional version produce significantly lower results than the other two. This indicates that although there is a difference between professional and non-professional subtitling, 
there are actually non-professional subtitles that can give uh, produce senior reception capacity scores for participants. I will also go back to this later. So in general, in general for the first hypothesis considering these different combinations, I would say that it is not possible to say that tack of subtitles is a factor that affects the reception of participants the, uh, if we look at the general overview of these different aspects. Now, looking at the second sub-hypothesis, level of L2, L3, in this case English, we can talk about the, first the percentage of fixations, that is how many fixations participants made on the screen and on the subtitles, the percentage of duration of fixations, so for how long they were watching uh, at the screen and at the subtitles, and we can evidently see a, high, um, a significant difference between participants with a low and participants with a high level of English. The same, but this difference is not evident in mean fixation uh, on the subtitles. So, although participants look for less time, participants with a high level of English look at the subtitles for less time when they do that, their mean fixations are similar to those of the, the low level of English participants. Talking about the mean fixations on the image, which is actually was actually very interesting. Participants in the high level of English actually have longer mean fixations on the image. This implies that since they have to go less to the subtitle area, their gaze maintains fixated on the screen for longer periods of time without much shifting. In terms of audience enjoyment, there was also a significant difference between people with a high and a low level of English, with participants with a high level of English report, uh, reporting a higher degree of enjoyment. Of the, of the audiovisual product. This could be related to the fact that participants during the interview said that reading subtitles are more cognitively demanding task. so this, um, this consideration regarding subtitles could actually reduce their degree of enjoyment during, of the clips during the screening session. So the second, so, uh, the second hypothesis of the study was actually confirmed. The third hypothesis was related to the uh, inclination towards the Iberian or the Latin American versions. Assuming that participants being from Spain would be uh, more inclined towards the Iberian version, this hypothesis all postulated that they would have a better reception capacity and declare lower reading, uh, a lower subtitle reading effort and a higher self-reported comprehension with the subtitles that were familiar or closer, linguistically closer to them as the agreement of times. But uh, participants didn't actually notice this difference and the, the reception capacity scores didn't show any significant difference between these two types of subtitles. In order to uh, wrap up and summarize these findings, we can say then that non-professional subtitles can be as good as professional subtitles in some cases, but that there is also variations within non-professional <coughs> subtitles, as we have seen between the two different groups. Some participants achieved uh, similar reception capacity scores with the first non-professional version, but not with the second non-professional version. Proficiency in the source language actually plays a role when participants are watching subtitles. Some participants are able to watch less or more of the subtitles depending on their knowledge of the source language, which uh, up to now hasn't been explored as one factor involved in the, in the subtitle reading process. And we can also see that there is no, not that straightforward preference for uh, the subtitle, the Iberian subtitles. In this case, the subtitles that were more, uh, that were closer to the participant. So there is actually no rejection, no straightforward rejection for Latin American subtitles. Although this could be also related to the fact that the clips were short, so the exposure time is less to to each type of subtitles. Regarding the interview data, uh, it was possible to see that participants use a lot of foreign of audiovisual content produced in other countries. Actually, most of the participants said that most of the content they watched was produced in, uh, in countries different to Spain. It was also interesting to see that they can decide, or, and some of them actually consciously decide when to use dubbing and when to use subtitling depending on different tasks. 
So one of the most relevant comments they made was the relation between subtitling and language learning. They, they think subtitles are more difficult to read, but they are willing to do that in order to access the content in the source language and in order to increase their linguistic skills. At the same time, if they, there are other factors that influence, influence these decisions, so if they are accompanied by someone who prefers uh, prefer subtitling, they would be able to or willing to watch the subtitled content, and if they are doing something else or if they are multitasking, they would prefer dubbing, so they are able to make this type of decisions. So it is not possible to say now that Spain, people in Spain are using only dubbing and that everyone is uh, uh, directly more inclined towards that product. Uh, going back to the difference in the <coughs> mean fixation duration on the subtitles that was significant in the analysis, and also in order to support this uh, finding with data from the interview session, I think one of the aspects that is more relevant uh, for this variable was the layout of the subtitles on the screen. The professional subtitles were different to the, in layout to the other two non-professional subtitles. As you can see, the non-professional ones are brighter and occupy less space uh, on the screen. Actually, the professional subtitles, in terms of which are at the top here, in terms of length, are shorter than the two non-professional ones. But due to the formatting, they look uh, longer and wider on the screen. However, although this the non-professional, the professional subtitle version had a lower, a shorter mean fixation duration. Participants during the interview session were more inclined to select the professional version as the non-professional version because of the layout. So here there is this uh, possible trade-off between how much the subtitles affect the reading, the format of the subtitles affects the reading behavior of the participants cognitively, and what the attitude towards the subtitles is. And this is something that up to now is not uh, explored. We don't know much about how people react to different types of uh, subtitles on the screen. We know people use different colors and their preferences, but we don't know how cognitively we, we, uh, people react to these differences in subtitles. Going back to the attention shift ratio and what I mentioned before, some scholars say that the lowest the attention shift, uh, the number of attention shifts, the better the uh, viewing process. However, I found that the professional subtitles that have Mm, the highest attention shift ratio had this because in between every two subtitles there is a window of 160 milliseconds in order to avoid the flash effect. So participants are actually able to go and read the subtitles, then glance at the image, and then go back at the subtitles and have this circular behavior. However, in the case of non-professional subtitles that don't respect this time frame in between subtitles, participants were more likely like in this case, uh, to remain on the subtitle area until the very last subtitle appeared and then go back to the image. So, so they were missing the action. And in this case, I think this is uh, the um, uh, summary of four subtitles. So the participant in orange, for instance, has only one fixation on the image while the others are able to go back and forth. And this is due to the, to the timing between the subtitles. So that's why I think that an attention shift ratio of two would be the measurement that we should follow in, our, in eye tracking studies to, uh, as an indicator of a smoother reading process because that implies that for each subtitle there are two shifts, one towards the subtitle area and then one back towards the image. As I mentioned before, it was also possible to see that there are differences in behavior that rela uh, are related to the language level of the participants so subtitling is not necessarily an automated task. Subtitle reading is not necessarily an automated task. I had some participants that were able to avoid, um, for instance, most of the subtitles and watch at the subtitle area for less than two percent of the time, and they knew when they were uh, they went to the subtitle, they were able to recall why they went to the subtitle area. And as we can see here, this is the summary of participants with a low level of English group on the left and participants with a high level of English 
uh, on the right. We can see that the concentration of fixations in the low level of English group is higher in the subtile area, where the concentration of fixations for the high level of English group is higher on the image. So participants, depending on their linguistic uh, skills, are able to give more relevance to one area or the other and are able to adapt their behavior to their needs when they are watching the content. Now, that were the results and complementary findings. Talking about limitations, the main and basic, most basic limitation of the study was actually one of the methods I choose, like working with eye tracking data. It's a very time consuming task and implies uh, that you have to, you need to have a lot of control over the variables and the data. So this restricts the number of participants and this was one of the reasons why I decided to exclude the needle, uh, the group that had a needle level of English. It could be the case that these people have a totally different behavior from all the others, but uh, by excluding them I was able also to see the difference the differences between the other two groups more clearly, so clearer, sir. So uh, this could be a technical restriction, but also helped helped me in the identification of the results. Another technical uh, restriction related to the eye tracking was the fact that we don't have specialized tools to analyze the eye track, the eye tracking data for subtitle. So most of the work has to be done manually, and this is one of the reasons why I decided to. Re, um, for the analysis, I decided to remain at the level of the subtitle area rather than looking at specific subtitles or the reading of specific words because carrying out this work for 52 participants for the amount of recordings I had uh, was just too, uh, too time consuming and would be a different type of study than the one I did. Uh, but this is related to the technical aspects and the participants. The type of subtitles that I have included in my study are only professional amateur subtitles. Those are the non-professional subtitles that I try to replicate what professionals do. But the different varieties of non-professional subtitling are endless. So exploring those other aspects could be also an interesting area of study for future research. However, here we're just restricted to to professional amateur subtitles and the results should be taken only should be taken into account only for this specific type of subtitle. And then there is the material related uh, limitation. I only include one TV series from one specific audiovisual genre. So it could be the case also a very popular TV series and non-professional subtitling communities tend to uh, pay more attention to some TV series than to the others depending on their popularity. So these results could also be different have I chosen a completely uh, unknown TV series or one that is in the very first season. So that should also be taken into account as a limitation of this study and may a possible op option for further research. Talking about the implications for translation studies, we can now see that people are using audiovisual translation modalities in a different way even in a, in a country that is traditionally seen as a dubbing country as is is Spain, and I have been able to show that there are empirical data backing up these considerations, which is something that comes to complement the views and the considerations we have about translation uh, right now. I, in the methodology session, and in general with the methods I included in my study, I tried to be as careful and detailed in the description as I could in order to see how, in order to provide enough tools for future researchers to take on that or to challenge, challenge the possible uh, things that I uh, didn't include or that I decide or the choices I made in, our, in designing the methodology. And I have also shown, as mentioned before, that there are differences in the type of non-professional subtitles. So most likely these differences uh, could be related to the differences in which the communities are structured and how they work. So there could be the case that some non-professional subtitling communities are more um, are more pro provide a mechanism that is better to boost translation competence. And I have actually been trying to use non-professional subtitling mechanisms and non-professional subtitling subtitles as part of uh, translator training in order to see how this could be complementing and how 
these different approaches could interact in a, in a context where most students could, could actually be identified with the type of profile of people doing these subtitles and people using the subtitles, so I try to see these convergences and this is presented just as the starting point of what could be done after that in this, in this matter. And that will be pretty much it for my presentation. I hope I provided a genuine complete overview. And thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and thanks for timing it here. Uh, and now it's uh, time. The Universidad Rodia de Guili, the uh, faculty, the Department of English and German Studies, and the research group uh, for having invited me, and me here, and for the uh, Esther Torres, and everyone working in this uh, research group. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm really honored. And, uh, I remember I even met uh, Mr. Correo back in 2011, as I remember, we were both attending a conference in Paris, and he approached me, as I have mentioned, uh, and, some, and, some and then we both attended the CETRA, the Center for Translation Studies in Lyon, although in different years, so it's very special for me being here today. And I'm also uh, glad and honored to be sharing this committee with Professor Chauma and uh, Professor Ennisberger. So I'm also relieved from any pressure because I know that they are going to be saying very sharp and very uh, important things. So um, as I am the first one speaking, um, I can keep it short and sweet, okay? <coughs> uh, I have many things to say, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, brief. So first I'm going to, I'm having a top-down approach uh, I would like to provide a general assessment of the PhD thesis, then I'm going to approach some specific or particular elements, and finally I will present some uh, suggestions and a couple of questions I thought regarding your, your PhD. So, uh, starting by the most uh, important thing, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, you for both the PhD thesis and also the presentation, because when we evaluate uh, the PhD in this viper, we do not only evaluate the text, the written text, which we have already processed, uh, we also have to evaluate uh, the candidate and the presentation, which was for me very clear and clean and uh, very easy to follow. Also, congratulations to your supervisor, uh, Professor Anthony Pim. Um, when you have to evaluate a PhD, the first question is, does this thesis contribute to the field? Translation studies, media studies, reception studies, uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, I've learned read, reading this text and I've enjoyed it. I always learn when I read a PhD. I do not always enjoy it, it depends. Uh, I have enjoyed uh, reading your, your PhD thesis. I think the topic of uh, amateur or non-professional subtitling and fans having uh, is needed. So this uh, piece of research was necessary. Um, this clearly deserves academic attention. Uh, probably there are some legal issues and the complexity of the topic um, makes that some scholars do not approach it, but I think this is not an alibi not to address the topic. Uh, so congratulations for having chosen this, this topic. I think you have written a very honest uh, thesis. Um, it doesn't hide or ignore uh, the possible limitations as you have uh, presented here. So it, in my opinion, adds extra uh, value to the, to the work. Uh, it is rather objective, I would say, with the topic of uh, fan subbing, fan subtitling, professional, non-professional uh, subtitling. And um, for me there is a very important element. Uh, this research line tries to um, take um, a particular illegal or conflictive situation and turn it into something positive for educational or research purposes. So this is obviously something positive and something uh, that deserves attention. It is a very personal PhD thesis. I like it uh, from the very uh, beginning. Uh, I think it is the first uh, page where you say 
uh, I am a translator. I think these are the, actually the first, uh, that's the first sentence, the first words in the, in the, in the text. Um, as for the formal elements, I think uh, it is very well written. Uh, it is nicely presented and it is a neat piece of, piece of writing. Uh, it has a very logical structure, very coherent uh, from my point of view, and a, a consistent uh, argumentation. Um, in the first chapter, uh, you provide a comprehensive view of today's uh, consumption habits as regards audiovisual products. I couldn't identify myself. I was myself profiled in, in some of these uh, consumption uh, patterns, and I could uh, myself being classified in one of the uh, categories. Um, it does also provide a very accurate report on the evolution from these consumers into prosumers. So it, it is a very good panorama on the emergence of fan subbing and, and the relation to the fandom culture, which I appreciate. Uh, I think the section where you approach uh, reception studies is also very, very, it is quite remarkable. And uh, the description of all the experiments with the eye tracking, there is a vast amount of work there. Uh, it's very accurate and it provides crystal clear view on, on, on the possible applications to the field. Um, even more importantly, I think this thesis comes to support uh, the idea which has already been, or has already been approached by some people, as Professor Chauma, that uh, the um, <clears throat> panorama in audiovisual translation and in translation studies in general is evolving, is changing. So these binary options are no longer probably uh, suitable. We, we are also in, uh, we are witnessing a, a more complex panorama and the emergence of this type of uh, audiovisual translation new tendencies, uh, if you may, um, is contributing to, to um, a less polarized uh, panoramic translation studies. Um, as I said, the issue of non-professional subtitling hasn't been sufficient, sufficiently approached from the point of view of uh, academia. And uh, I think it is rather obscure uh, due to the importance and the relevance of the topic nowadays. Um, probably the main reasons have to be found in the complexity of the field and also in the fact that it requires a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach. And I think uh, you have been quite um, successful in uh, approaching an interdisciplinary uh, thesis. I think the methodology is very consistent, systematic and very thorough. Um, as I said, there is a vast amount of work there with specifically the part of uh, eye tracking. Uh, it seems that you have talked to everyone, you have asked everyone, so, uh, Great work there. Uh, the tables and all the figures are very appropriate, uh, particularly some of them, uh, for instance, the summary in page 142 was very clarifying. And I absolutely agree with your view on the need for a um, eclectic or mixed methodology here. Not many, many authors in translation studies and in humanities use statistics, use uh, SPSS, ANOVA, and this kind of uh, methodology, that means quantitative methodology. I think it's appropriate, why not, to take some of the uh, techniques and, and uh, strategies used, for example, in the social sciences uh, in into translation. That can uh, render some positive uh, results. Uh, especially when you, as, as it was your case, uh, use this triangulation of methods. So in that sense, the, the thesis can fill a gap. Uh, <clears throat> I also find uh, your approach is rather suitable when considering that non-professional subtitling doesn't have to be necessarily assessed with the same standards and the same patterns of professional uh, translation, as was also suggested by, for example, uh, the Athenas and some other people. And again, in this line, I find one of the most relevant results or one of the most relevant findings of your uh, work this uh, deconstruction of uh, the binary classification between users who prefer subtitling or dubbing. Because uh, your thesis demonstrates that uh, users are not homogeneous in this sense, and there are many profiles of uh, 
of uh, users in terms of uh, consumption of sulfide. I think the thesis opens new doors and elicits new questions because it is solid research. And now I have some suggestions and, and uh, proposals uh, that just come to, to improve what is already a uh, remarkable piece of research. Uh, most of my questions have been already addressed here and also on page uh, 233, section uh, 7.3, uh, where you comment on the limitations of the research. Um, perhaps I was some additional references could be added. Uh, I was, uh, perhaps it was missing some, some uh, references to the field of subtitling and its possible application in the, in the field of language teaching. I was thinking, probably I think that's did it, for example, but in particular uh, I was missing Noah Ravan and, and perhaps uh, Jennifer Lertola, who I met here in 2000 something, I'm sorry, here in, in Tarragona, in a conference. And they both uh, explore uh, the application of subtitling for language vocabulary acquisition uh, and language learning. I had some reservation about the assessment of the English level and the design of the question. Of course, I understand this was not the topic of the, of the research, and it would be impossible to, to construct, to design uh, an English test that is a thesis by itself, okay? But I'm not sure about the reliability of the English test with only eight items that do not cover the, the four uh, competencies. But again, I understand that this clearly falls uh, out of the scope of the, uh, of the uh, research. And perhaps the questioners uh, in, the, in the appendices could be more, more developed and include some specific scales focusing on topic or, or having used uh, from Vax Alpha to, to, to assess the consistency and all that things that, again, uh, the methodology is very solid and, and I think you did it very well. Um, you mentioned uh, at the end uh, that uh, perhaps it would have been worthy the inclusion of a group of native speakers in it. Uh, I agree. Uh, I also think it could have been interesting assessing the impact uh, subtitling has on the language attitude of, of uh, consumers and taking into account their habits and patterns as, as regards the use of inter and intra language uh, intralinguistic uh, subtitling and subtitles perhaps. Uh, as for the questioners I only have uh, more, one more suggestion that is probably a personal obsession and it is not using or using an, uh, an even number of uh, possible choices for the Likert scale because sometimes, well, of course, this is an open question in uh, research, but I prefer that again, it's a personal obsession in order to avoid the neutral uh, possible, possible uh, answers. And perhaps the, the, the design of the interviews could be further uh, explained, but again, there is not room for everything in a PhD thesis. As for my questions, I have only three or four things because I know that my colleagues would focus or will focus on uh, other areas. Mr. Correbo, do you think with, with this result, the result of this thesis, um, do you think that this should be included, I mean, all this should be included in uh, translation studies at the universities? I mean, what is the role of uh, translator trainers? Should we approach, I know it's, it's a very difficult question and I do not, uh, I'm not expecting a yes, no answer, or whatever. This is just a, uh, an idea, okay? The second one uh, would be, uh, which could be the implication for translation studies uh, related fields, for some for dubbing, uh, or for, um, which could be the situation in related areas such as video games. And the third one, uh, and again, this is not really a question, it's more a thought. Um, I'm very uh, concerned with the, with the tension between the global and the local. And within the thesis, I was thinking that I think there is a paradox here, because we are living in the global area where English is or has been established as the international lingua franca, franca de facto, etc. But these people continue localizing into their own culture, into their own language. So, uh, fun subtitling is consolidating. So I see a kind of paradox here, because more and more people at the same time are accessing online contents through the medium of English. 
and also, hopefully, the level of English of, for example, young people in Spain is improved. So I see a, a paradox here. And just to conclude, I would say that uh, I think that the PhD is relevant because it presents an original contribution. It is relevant uh, for the field of translation studies, and uh, it can be replicated. Uh, so it is scientifically uh, acceptable. And I would like to include, uh, tell you that the thesis is not the end; it is just the beginning. Uh, somebody told me that when I was uh, obsessed myself in, in, in the theatre in Belgium. A professor told me that, and I didn't. I didn't understand it until now. So four or five years uh, after that. So I think you have a prominent academic career uh, ahead of you, and I wish you the best of luck in all your endeavors. Again, thank you all for having invited me, and congratulations. Thank you very much, Dr. Fernandez Gonzalez. Would you like to ask him now? Yes, sure. Okay, so thank you very much for the comments and the suggestions, and I answer the three questions and comment on the deeper scale decision. When I started doing the the project and when I started with the design of the questionnaires, I was not sure which type of statistical tools I was going to use for the analysis. So I was following closely the design proposed by Catherine, who uses a uh, even number of equal scales because later in the analysis he basically classifies the groups into people who agree or disagree. So having a middle point in order to do that was impossible. So I my design follows closely that. But then for the due to the methods I use I could have as well just go for an uh, even number uh, sorry for an odd number equal scale, more traditional like a five or a seven level equal scale. So it was as a, it was that decision was part of the methodological choices at, at the moment. And then it stayed because my, the type of analysis that I did came after the data was collected. So it was impossible to change the questionnaires and then run the experiments again. So that's, that's the explanation for that. And then the first question was the inclusion of um, non-professional subtitling and these practices in translator training and translation studies. So I've been trying to do this actually in, in my classes here, not directly uh, including everything, but trying to assess what could be useful for students in their class and, and what could help them develop translation competence. So most of the aspects, or the main aspect that I found interesting in this community is for translator training is the peer reviewing process. They have very internal and structured peer reviewing processes with people mentoring the newcomers in order to provide more feedback. And they also, in some cases, in some websites, have even the users providing feedback on the translations. So this constant assessment changes the view of um, a unique and simple assessment, final assessment of translation. It shows to them that translations are constantly evaluated and changeable and that they respond to different needs and that different opinions can have room uh, when they are trying to make choices for translations. So I think aspects like that could be added to translator training and could actually help to change some views in translation studies in general. But I do think that uh, prior to adopting any kind of, uh, taking any kind of decision related to what we take and what we uh, refuse, we need we need to know more about what's happening in professional translation because there is the manifestations are very varied and the way how groups operate are almost case scenarios in all cases. Like each group operates in a different way. There are shared patterns among groups, but there are other aspects that affect the, each specific group. So until we do, we're not sure about what we have and what we can take and what would the implications of uh, these decisions be. I don't think we can simply adopt everything as, as it is. Um, that partially answers the implication for or tradition related fields, right? And then the question about the global and the local in fan sub um, One of the interesting aspects about fan sub is that it started as a way to break with the rules of the importation rules in the United States. So an underrepresented culture was taken uh, and censored when it was imported into the United States. So groups decided to take on that, uh, people decided to take 
on this role and then take this culture, this content, and do themselves the job. And that was the uh, a small culture in going into a larger culture. If we want to talk about powers and how the Japanese and the American cultures relate. However, now what is happening is that non-professional subtitle is helping the distribution of content producing this more powerful culture which already is already distributed through the legal and official channels. So there is this repetition and this incongruency between what was happening in the 80s when Fansovin started and what is happening now. And in some cases, with non-professional subtitling, the community don't really filter what is being produced and just try to take the foreign as it is, or try to make some uh, operating, operating at the interculture, they try to make choices, but mostly related to uh, giving more power to the source and replicating realities that do not comply with their own reality. So there is this incongruency going on in the discussion between the global implications for non-professional subtitling and how cultures interact on this distribution of content. But, um, however, there are other cases also in which unrepresented films, for instance Arabic films or uh, films from Eastern Europe are translated also through these channels. Korean uh, productions are also going abroad for uh, going abroad and being distributed in other countries and I think Nigerian films are also distributed widely mostly thanks to non-professional subtitles in English so there's the, the discussion of powers here is constantly shifting and the positions of the different cultures is also uh, redefined as it goes and, oh, uh, and for the implications for TS related fields I forgot to say before that although in the Spanish culture, let's say, that subtitling is taking grounds that were before assigned to dubbing, this is not the same case for other countries. In Latin America, for instance, channels that 10 years ago were only broadcasting subtitled content are now broadcasting dubbed content. So depending on each uh, culture and the traditions from each place, the modalities of audiovisual translation, the preferences regarding these modalities are changing depending on what people know. It's not that everyone's moving towards one or the other side, but people are learning how I'm going to use different tools because they, they could answer better and meet their needs better, their, their wishes. Um, did I leave anything else? Okay. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, Mr. Perry. Thanks, Professor Ernstberger, the turn. Uh, so, uh, you can do now all the observations, questions, or suggestions you would like to, to go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. When I was asked, I was delighted to say yes to be part of this. Mm -hmm. Our team has been following Mr. Rego's work for the past couple of years, past few years. And, calendars and, conferences. and I was very pleased to read the work you've been doing. Um, I'd also like to begin just with some general comments. Um, I think that there are a lot of very admirable things about this thesis that my colleague already mentioned. I won't repeat those, but um, I'll focus a bit more on the methodological. The pilot study that you did and reported to you is very important in this kind of work very valuable, and it did something. We changed things based on the pilot study, which is very good to report. And the pre-experimental questionnaire made a lot of sense to me in selecting your sample to find your population. You recognize that perhaps the bulk of consumers may have been missed in your particular design, but you explained that very convincingly. The amount of work has been mentioned, and it is truly admirable. Um, working with eye tracking data, I know what this means. <laughs> um, and your analysis of different results, very rigorous, very admirable, very transparent. Um, the rigor in getting comparable groups and comparable clips. You addressed that difficulty, remains a difficulty in translation studies, how to have comparable source texts. That's no different in audiovisual translation, how to have comparable text. But you've at least talked about it um, and the way you stated your hypotheses and your sub-hypotheses is also to be commended. Many um, 
species forget to do that as you in many articles. So I, um, your life does not end here, and I would encourage you to continue to be that reverse. It's very, very good. Um, your statistical analysis also very admirable. I, perhaps other people in the audience haven't read the thesis, but your summary table on page 183 was very valuable. To be commended, to try to package your results in a way that there's an overview. I found that very, very helpful. Um, the quality of your data, you've explained it, you've assured it as best we can with this kind of methodology. And the fact that you did a reception study, I really want to praise. It's really, as you pointed out yourself, is something that's really needed. Um, and methodologically, you've really shown us how this can be done properly. Right. Um, if I can make any suggestions, for example, when you're writing up some of this research, um, you presented the results very thoroughly and sometimes perhaps more than you needed to, figures and tables, and the highlighting in the text slows the reader down, but it's absolutely there, that's the nice part but wouldn't have to be included, perhaps, in that much repetition. Oh. That's a suggestion. I, I tried hard to find things to criticize. <laughs> um, one minor, minor point, if I, you rewrote the thesis, you might want to present the qualitative results before you mention them. It's this point when you talk about your qualitative results, you didn't totally right. But that's totally different. But that's, these are, yes, things I tried. But I do have some questions that I'd be very interested in hearing your answers to. Um, in my tradition and culture, it would be much more of a dialogue, but I'm happy to bundle my questions and then have you Does respond. Prefer okay. to no, we'll do it that way. Yeah. Um, when in Spain, as I say. Um, one is a, a rather provocative question. Is, um, was it worth it to use iCloud? It's a lot of work. We know it's a lot of work. Those of us who've done it, those of us who've read it, recognize it was a lot of work. And if if it wasn't, would comprehensibility have been enough? Things like comprehensive, really well thought out comprehensibility questions, would that have gotten the kinds of information we were looking for in answering hypotheses? So the interesting here we have to enough. If you say it was worth it, I'd like to hear what the most useful eye tracking measures are and why. Because you did a lot. We tend to do that. We look at lots of different things. So which ones would you recommend people focus on with this kind of research instead of spending time doing all kinds of different things? And it may well be we need to do it all. Um, a really hard question is how do we measure cognitive effort? I know how you say people do, how you try to get at it, and picking up on something you said in your very clear presentation, um, that fixation durations were longer in the image area. What does that tell us about cognitive effort? Do you have, in the meantime, you've written this, had a bit of a break to think about it, are there completely different explanations for your results that you didn't look at? Could it be something completely different? And I'd be very interested in just hearing something you, you hinted at at the end of your thesis and at the end of your presentation, this notion of questioning norms, pushing norms, and how non, what we can learn in translation studies and as teachers from non-professionals. A lot, sorry, but I'm really interested in what you have to say. Okay, so the first one is related to was it worth using iPhone? I think it was not only to know that it could be used, but also to know that it would, there could be other modes without iPhone. Because one of the problems that I had during the experiment was this. I was spending about 10 minutes with each participant only calibrating the eye tracker. And considering the amount of time of the experiment, that was one of the reasons why I didn't go for more 
uh, comprehension questions because I didn't want people, I didn't want to ask people to come to the lab for two hours for free because I wasn't paying them anything. So I think that from that perspective, uh, it's interesting to see that it was possible to do it and to combine all the methods and that it could work, it could uh, produce some insights as to for example, the differences in layout, how that affects the people's perception and how that affects their reactions to the subtitles. In order to see these two different aspects at least and to be able to convert them with empirical data, I think it provides interesting results and I think uh, for aspects like that, uh, it was worth doing the analysis. Now, the comprehensibility and the, in general, the aspects of reception, also going back to the aspects of uh, comparing translated content used by uh, users of the translations and then natives using the content. I think that's um, actually a different area of research that would be very interesting because so far we're seeing how people, how much they are understanding from the content and saying that they do and they don't understand, but we don't really know how much natives, for instance, understand from the content and measuring comprehension of it because. And although there are studies using native, compared natives and non-natives, the reports normally don't provide uh, as many details as they should or the results are not uh, presented in detail, I think. So uh, in terms of comprehensibility, it's not only how much we ask people or how to ask people, but uh, having a, com a point of comparison for what, the we are, for what we are asking. Right? What, are the, what is the standard or how much uh, are people actually expected to understand from the content? Because when you're familiar with the content, as I was by the end of the experiments, I was already reciting the content by heart, dialects, and everything, you get to notice other aspects. So, how, what is that that people should take on the first time they watch it? And I think this also affects the type of questions that we ask during the comprehension and reception studies. So, uh, were the first two questions. It is about comprehensibility. Is it, is it okay or? Mm, I meant more, um, why not just use comprehensibility measures to try to answer those hypotheses? Instead of eye tracking? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think it is possible and I think the advantage of doing that would be uh, including more participants because you could have a group screening instead of individual sessions and it would be much more time efficient in that sense. But I think taking into account that eye tracking is now becoming uh, more prominent at the research translation studies, and that one of the problems that we have with doing eye tracking is that we don't have uh, much research to refer to or uh, many guidance to follow, it it's becomes very, very hard. And that's why I try to be as specific as possible in the methodology section in order to give also value to that. And I think from, from my Point of view and from where I stand, at least from that session, I try to show people how to use eye tracking and how to use eye tracking for audiovisual translation studies in, in specific terms. I think the other possibility is also interesting and in terms of generalizability of the results and in terms of coverage of participants would be uh, interesting to do it. But for now, uh, regarding the benefits that as a field uh, I could. Um, generate by doing this eye tracking size, I think that makes it valid, at least at this moment of the field, at this moment in which we are. And that takes me to the measurement and cognitive effort, because it is normally assumed that longer fixations imply more cognitive effort, but that's not a straightforward measurement, because as we've seen, the fixations of the image, which, to which you refer to, they are longer but maybe not because they imply they are more cognitively demanding, but because it's a more relaxed environment and people are just watching at the image and the images are moving, the eyes don't need to move. So that, that was uh, one of the issues when I tried one of the quality measurements, for instance. I could not simply use mean fixation duration as a quality measurement because the behavior in the image and the subtitles is completely different. And there was no standard for the subtitle area. So, that uh, quality measurement was not uh, useful for me. Now, 
Consider something that I didn't present here, but that's included in the thesis, the behavior of the participants with a high level of English who never use subtitles. I think only that shows that cognitive effort could be measured uh, taking into account the main fixation duration. Because these participants, in the, they were just a few, I think five or six participants, who would go to, the, to a subtitle area on very few occasions and on very specific times to look for information and their fixations were much longer than the fixations of all the other participants who were, regardless of their level of English and regardless of how used to they were, how used they were to using subtitles. So in that sense, on that specific occasion, that we can assume that participants go to a subtitle area to look for information for something they don't understand, and they could say for longer on these uh, words or on these subtitles, we could imply that there is a, a higher demand of cognitive resources, at least in these in this sessions. And I think that is actually the only measurement that I include that could be related to cognitive effort in my thesis, and that's why I don't cover the, the issue that much. Another aspect that could be used to measure cognitive effort would be, as I mentioned before, had I had tools to analyze the fixations on the specific subtitles or to map the fixations to the specific words in the subtitles, then it could be able to, uh, the uh, data could be show which words are more demanding and based on, we, you could select which words are more demanding and then try to see if these words are harder to read or require uh, longer fixations. Because that, exploring that would provide more insights into attract and cognitive resources allocation. But uh, in my case, I only use the fixation duration and I uh, find that you, or I found that it was interesting to see, at least for this small group, that the fixations were longer. Because in all other cases, in the time they spend on the subtitles and the uh, number of fixations they made, I think I actually have very much here somewhere. Yes. So this group here is the group uh, of people with a high level of English who never use subtitles, while this other is are people with a high low level of English. In, uh, the, in the cases when we were talking about percentage of fixation durations as this one and percentage of fixations as such, the image was pretty much like this one. But when it comes to mean fixation duration, this group were at the top. So it shows that when they were watching the subtitles, they really want to go to see the subtitles and they spent a long time on specific words in the subtitles because it was mean fixation duration tells us the differences into of specific fixations instead of the duration of all of them. So I think as uh, taking that into account, eye tracking and subtitling, uh, eye tracking could be used for subtitling in order to see these specific cases when people need to allocate more resources. Mm. And that explains somehow, and fixations were longer on the image? That's the next question. I think is they were longer on the image. The problem is that there's not much research on moving images and eye tracking because it's very complex because uh, with eye tracking software, you are better off, you simply have to analyze static images because words or images will be always in the same case. So we don't know much about how people watch films using eye tracking. But I think the fixations are longer because people have the tendency, or we have the tendency, um, uh, to be say on the center on the, of the screen. And mostly the fixations, uh, when you are looking only at the image, are located at the center of the screen. So if you have to look here, instead of doing this shifting, there's no much effort that you, can, that you need to do. And the image is moving. Your gaze doesn't need to move because the image is already doing the process. And in, when creating films, uh, cinematographers know that the center of the screen is the one that's calling the attention, unless you want to produce a very different effect, in which case they will do something different. But the center of the screen is the center of focus. And people will look there, so if you don't have to switch and disturb your image watching with the subtitle reading, then you just stay there and that affects the, the fixation duration of the image. I think that's my assumption, although I think we still need to know more about how people watch uh, moving images. And 
the last question was about the norms. I was actually very happy to find this information about the flash effect because one of the problems we have with uh, subtitling is that we have norms, but those norms, norms were proposed in the 90s and we don't have empirical testing of these norms. So having the flash effect normally uh, is assumed to, is postulated based on the fact that uh, having subtitles overlapping would give people the impression that the subtitles don't change, so that you avoid reading the second subtitle. And by this, that's not the case. If subtitles are overlapping, you don't go to the image, you stay in the subtitle because you notice there is a change. So in, in that sense, I think I have something that could help us understand better how subtitles should be done. And maybe the norm is there, but we, the reason for the norm to be there is not the one we assumed, but the one that is providing viewers with a better and smoother reading process, with more circular reading process. And Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thanks. And uh, well, now it's my turn. And then, well, I always say that since many observations have already been made, I'll try to be short, but I never <laughs> comply with that. Anyway. Thanks to the, uh, first of all, thanks to the Department of English and, and German Studies. Um, thanks to Professor Tim for giving me the opportunity to read this thesis and learn uh, a lot from that. And thanks to Esther Torres for the organization of, of all this event. Uh, I'm also happy to share this table with these two colleagues. One of them I didn't have the opportunity to to meet before, so it is the first one for us. The other one, I think last time we met, it was three years ago, more than three years ago. I also am very happy to see that the candidate has read the, uh, the end of his, of his PhD thesis. I think we met, last time we met, it was in Dubrovnik, mm -hmm. maybe. And you were working hard with, with, the, with the thesis already, and I'm very happy to see that. It's over now. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, as well, in the Spanish way, I want to congratulate you for this brilliant and innovative piece of thesis, and I also want to congratulate your supervisor, Professor Pin. I, I think I have many reasons to congratulate you. Many of them have been already said, but I will just highlight six of them. Uh, first, this is a very well written dissertation, right? Uh, Easy to follow, easy to read, is, as already been said, with hardly any typo and hardly any mistake. Uh, at least I haven't been able to find them, right? Uh, I only, the only thing I miss really is a DVD with the, with the clips. Uh, nowadays, uh, in, in, in the visual translation, the thesis, it is like sort of, it's not compulsory, of course, but it's sort of, you know, uh, unusual to. Uh, you know, to, to, to give a, a DVD or a USB or whatever, a memory stick or whatever, with the, with the clips in order for the committee, to, for the panel to check that what you say is true and that the subtitles are like this or like that, because otherwise we have to uh, rely on you. We do, of course, we do. <laughs> but it would be, I mean, have been, you know, very, very useful for us to, to have this DVD or USB or whatever, right? So th that's the only thing that is in the, the formal component of the thesis. Second, the thesis, uh, I mean, it is a very innovative topic from studying non-professional subtitling, uh, a, a really under-researched topic in the area of audiovisual translation, like Dr. Fernando Stan said before as well. Third, uh, because the candidate is to be commended for his choice of the topic, the choice, the choice of your topic, and especially for the methodological tools you've devised, for example, for yourself to have access to all the materials examined in the thesis. Uh, I think that you use a robust and powerful methodology with two groups of subjects, very well defined according to their level of English, a variety of instruments, surveys, eye tracking sessions, interviews, qualitative and quantitative analysis, both of them all together, uh, triangulation, I mean, the methodology may be used in this really impeccable. It's really, 
it's very good. Um, there are some issues that have been raised up by Dr. Ehrensberger, though, but I think that really, I mean, it's replicable, as Dr. Philanthropist said before as well. I mean, it can be replicated, right? Because the thesis is process oriented and not product oriented. That's something which is really uh, needed in you know, the visual translation. I think that we all here can agree that almost uh, the, the almost absolutely absence of process oriented studies in you know, visual translation. And it makes this thesis a timely and much needed research. So that's another very uh, strong point. Uh, because I think that this is represents a significant contribution to knowledge of the subject by its originality and also by the exercise of independent critical powers. Uh, I mean, you do not only describe what you find, but you also give uh, your opinion about that, and that's very good. My congratulations for the uh, candidate's overall performance and ability to defend your thesis in this vibe. And my congratulations, of course, for the huge amount of work you've done in your thesis. And having said that, it seems obvious that when one writes about 300 pages, uh, he or she, he or his, will be subject to criticism. And that's, I mean, the name of the game. In my <laughs> but this is also good. Uh, I will just structure my criticism into inverted commas because I really uh, like your thesis into three parts. This a wee bit about human terminology, a big bit, a big bit <laughs> about translation studies and audiovisual translation study issues, right? And just a couple of things about methodology and one final thing about ethics and translation. But human terminology, as I was telling you before, I mean, the thesis is impeccable. Maybe there's a couple of things. When you, in the reference section, uh, sign the Athenas et al., for example, if you cite et al, it is because there are three or more uh, uh, co-writers of the book. If there is just one co-writer, then normally you have to uh, um, to give both of them, right? So the think of et al, for me, was like three or four or five people participating in, in the book. It is not. In both cases, it's just a couple of, of writers. Uh, about the work by Serenella Masida, which is really like as well, and you mentioned it, uh, in the thesis, you, you cite your PhD thesis, but I don't know if you know that it's been recently published. In, yes. Did you know that? Okay, okay, in Paul Grave Macmillan. Yes. Piper. Piper series, yeah. It's already been published, and, and just, but, but maybe it was published after you printed your PhD thesis, I, I guess. Yes, and, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. and I accessed the, the, there was a first review on Google, in Google Docs in Google Books, yes. and it's different. She adds more content, that's so right. it was not possible for me to have access to the complete yeah. version. And that's why I mentioned that because it's different from the from her PhD thesis, yes. right? And then something that maybe it's just a personal taste. When you, when you mentioned Iberian non-professional subtitles, Iberian uh, translators, Iberian uh, subtitles, and Iberian whatever. Uh, you know, when you you make a distinction between Iberian and Latin American, right? I think I, I'd rather go for European Spanish subtitles, European Spanish translators, rather than Iberian. For, uh, at least for me, as, as I don't know, maybe as, uh, as an Iberian <laughs> person, for me, Iberian would mean both Portugal and Spain. So for me, it was a bit misleading because when you just mentioned Iberian, Iberian, and I was looking at your thesis to see if you had dealt with Portuguese somewhere, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. So, uh, I don't know if in your country you say Iberian Spanish when you speak about, uh, I don't think so, I don't no. think so. Maybe you say Spanish or Castilian Spanish, Castilian, right? Maybe Castilian Spanish would be an option. I don't like it either, right? Because, for example, in the Canary Islands, do they speak Castilian Spanish or Andalusia? I wouldn't say Castilian uh, uh, Spanish either, although, for example, in Peru or Argentina, they, they, they use it. But maybe European Spanish could be, I mean, European Spanish. So this is just something for you, for, for, for the future, for your publication, right? And for the, uh, so Iberian for me is a bit misleading, right? 
Okay, uh, that was the first small block. Second one is translation studies issues and audiovisual translation issues. This is longer, but I'll try to be short. Uh, I'll focus on chapter one, two, and three, because these are the chapters devoted to theory, right? Rather than the uh, analysis which has been already discussed by Dr. Eros Berger and uh, uh, Well, uh, everything is very well written, very clear. Chapter one includes the objectives of the thesis, an overview of the methodology, the structure, so on and so forth. You really are able to identify the niche which your study attempts to fill. Uh, maybe I, the only thing I missed there was, or has been the formulation of the research questions motivating your study. They are, they are very clear. They are in chapter four, right? The sections, I think, 411 and 412. But I would have, I mean, for me as a reader, it would have been easier to know them from, the, from scratch, from the beginning of the, of the, of the thesis. Um, you are able to locate your object of study from subbing and the reception of some fun subs in the context of Western new audiences. And that's very nice as well. In chapter two, you give a general overview of the current modes of interaction between viewers, the visual content, te technological developments, and so on. And that's a very nice chapter as well. Uh, just this is not very important, right? But in my view, there is no need to cite Pope. Benedict XVI in his message for the 47th world to say that <laughs> what he says has already been said by many authorities in academia. He says that the digital environment is not a parallel or purely virtual world, but it's part of the daily experience of many people. I mean, these general statements uh, that have been said by many, many, many people in academia, I mean, for me, in a, in a scientific piece with this, it's shocking to see for them, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just my, my perception. <laughs> uh, some statements need uh, qualifying, and maybe it's because uh, something good, and it's because you are young, and then <laughs> you just go ahead and, and, and say things like, for example, about captures. You say every regular internet user is probably required to perform this authentication process at least once a day. And I, I was worried about myself because I, I, I just do it you know, once a month, maybe. But I'm, I'm, we're not regular. We're not regular. Okay. <laughs> so that's the reason why. That's the reason why. But I'm, I'm constantly using the internet 10 or 12 hours a day. So I don't know. But anyway, for me, it needs a bit qualifying, right? Uh, something which is really more. Uh, it's not a. a it's how do you check? You say that on March the 3rd, last March, HBO announced that HBO Now, a standalone version of HBO Go streaming service, will be launched by April the 12th. So, three days ago, I think? Yeah, three days ago. In time for the fifth season premiere of Game of Thrones. Have you checked this? Okay, yes, it went down to actually one week before it was expected. Okay. 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 I actually changed it because they announced it two days before printing the thesis. Okay. So I've been following that. Okay. First, it was an announcement from last year. And uh, good to know. Good to know. Something else. Uh, you state on page 18 that the discourse of cultural imperialism and the Americanization of television suggests that these conditions. In, uh, benefit the representation and reproduction of a reality created through the lens of the US industry, instead of allowing for local constructions of self-identity transmitted through productions. Uh, you say, in short, US ideologies are channeled through the visual content and are imposed on other regions as a vision of the world. I, I quite agree with that. But at the same time, we've got this new thing called transcreation transportation is like uh, character reinvention for example there, there are many 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 examples right from commercials to spider-man for example spider-man reinvented in india uh, and rebaptized as let me check it well in, in hindi whatever 
Pavitra Prabhakar. I sorry for my for my Hindi, which is a phonetic distortion of Peter Parker, right? He lives in Mumbai, he wears baggy white trousers, uh, and he fights a demon from Indian mythology. All names in the Indian comic resemble those of the original version, but the setting and everything is Indian, right? So do you think that audiences are behind this, these new movements of transcreation? Do you think that it's also a, a balance between old uh, uh, mass media broadcasters and, and this new power of, of new audiences that make these things happen, right? Um, what else? Some statements that it might you need qualifying as well. Uh, for, for example, I quote, page 19. Furthermore, reporting news and a given series of film according to the original release schedule implicitly acknowledges that viewers have found workarounds to overcome the, bar the barriers and access the content before the official programming. And I think that you were mentioning the critics and the journalists doing the, the uh, um, uh, commenting the film or whatever. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether they have found a workaround to overcome the barriers, or maybe they are just translating websites or blogs or newspaper articles written in the USA, for example. I'm not sure. Well, maybe some of them do, right? I mean, some of them download the episodes and all these things, right? But I'm not sure. I wouldn't say that it is the. Uh, uh, the usual trend. I think that it's easy for them to find a blog or a website or whatever and then translate or comment uh, according to what the, uh, written, what the article written in English says about this uh, new thing, this new product or whatever. Right? Something that in my view also needs qualifying. You say that, that I put when at the beginning of the page 19, sorry, when at, at the beginning of the new century national audiences started to become interested in TV series and films produced in the United States. And uh, when I read that, I took, well, I, I thought that you meant that international audiences started to become interested in TV series and films in this new century, at least the way it is written, right? And uh, I think that international audiences have always been interested in American films and TV series since the introduction of cinema and TV all around the globe. In, in this country, for example, in the 60s, uh, Bewitched or Wallanza, or, or, or uh, I mean, in the 70s, for example, Dynasty or uh, Dallas or Falcon Crest or, and so on and so forth. I mean, all these things have always been in our lives and uh, not at the beginning of the new century onwards, right? Um, not to say nothing of American cartoons, which were the only ones we could watch in the 70s, in the 60s, or in the 80s, right? Something else. You say that in order to enjoy visual products all over the world, geographical problems have been solved, thanks to the internet, of course, technological developments, interconnectivity, and so on and so forth. But what about China and North Korea, for example? Uh, I mean, you take for granted that geographical problems are not the ones uh, that prevent us from uh, enjoying audiovisual products from all over the world, right? Um, th that's a general statement, and that is true. But maybe it's not true in all countries, right? Uh, chapter 3 about the current state of the research concerning our non-professional subtitling. Um, you see in page 26 that when dealing with collaborative translation, when the target audience is the same as the people doing the translation, why do you say that, and I quote, 26, this new framework cannot be explained by most of the previous translation theories. The debate about the orientation of a translation, either towards the target or towards the source, does not apply when there is no external agent producing a translation to be consumed by a known 
use of this. Uh, why don't you think, for example, that functionalism cannot explain the functionalism phenomenon? I would like to know that, right? You have time to think about that. <laughs> uh, but because I'm not so sure that functionalism, functional theories, cannot explain that. Uh, in professional audiovisual translation, when you translate, uh, when you are given a commission, uh, you don't know either the uh, prospective audience or your words. I mean, they will be consumed by unknown users as well. In the commissions, really, you don't get, in my experience, you don't get exact or, 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 or concrete or particular guidelines to do the translation, for example, when the film has two languages, say English and another one, British or whatever, I've never been said, I've never been uh, said explicitly to translate the second language. When I found them, I said, should I translate the Turkish lines, for example? I said, you are the translator. So they take the decision. So that's been my, my experience, you know, the visual translation commissions. So in my, what I mean is that I cannot see a clear difference uh, from uh, functional theories. Uh, I mean, I think that functional theories can explain both from studying and unknown. But I would like to know uh, why, you, the, why you think the opposite, right? Also, generally speaking, you say, no, sorry, it's, it's me now. Generally speaking, Fansalini is oriented towards the source. And you use some references, right? Uh, who support this. And this is true. For example, Fate Tosa, 2009, and many others. I think we can all agree with that. But then, again, why do you think that the debate adequacy versus acceptability is no longer valid in Fansalini? Right? I think sometimes you make this, these big statements, challenging current theories, but I don't know whether it is necessary to build a new theory uh, for fun subbing, or maybe we can sort of fit the fun subbing phenomenon in the uh, current theories we already have. Of course, there, there are many, many things that are not, you know, the, the, the streamlined things that we, I used to read in big theories, right? And you're right with that. Well, I'm a bit against of building a new theory for a new product, right? Sometimes it's, uh, for example, this thing of acceptability and democracy, right? For organizing domesticated things and so on and so forth. Uh, why can't we speak of something in these terms, right? Uh, what else? Yes, a final, a final question. Uh, could you give us a definition of that's a bit difficult. Non-professional collaborative translation, on the one hand, crowdsourcing translations, on the other hand, for some, sometimes it's a bit slippery, isn't it? And they think that these terms are used indistinctively and they have slight different meanings. Uh, they have slight different meanings. They are the same ones. But for me, for example, Gandhi's classification is rather confusing. This, for me, is very confusing. OK. just. A couple of questions from methodology and one more about ethics, and that's all. This is a difficult one. <laughs> Was hypothesis number two necessary? <laughs> uh, what I mean is, isn't, wasn't it too obvious to state that people with a high level of English wouldn't need the subtitles and the other ones would need them? Sometimes in humanities we need to validate all these things because sometimes we take for granted many, many, many things. I mean, it's obvious. But in, in this particular case, uh, wasn't it too obvious? Or, I mean, it's, that, that's a difficult one, right? Uh, for me, it's an assumed statement rather than a hypothesis, but anyway. Uh, what else? Yeah, in hypothesis number two, do you go back to the old debate between professional and non-professional subtitling, which in your view has to give way to another debate, focused on empowerment and the focus of the concept of translation itself, rather than on that. So for me, it was a bit 
you know, contradictory as well. Um, okay, and then the eye tracking analysis uh, that was already. But th I had the same question about eye tracking itself. I, I can I can I tell you an anecdote. I, I, five years ago, I think I was in a conference in Alicante, and then uh, Dr. Orero, the Orero from the Autonomous Barcelona, showed us a clip of, of Marie Antoinette, the film, right? And then in that clip, he was uh, traveling, the camera was passing by the, all the, the clothes of Marie Antoinette, right? Historic clothes and very nice clothes, and the ones belonging to a queen, right? But then, you could, well, theoretically, you could see a pair of tennis shoes there, which is something really shocking in a, in a film depicting the, the 18th century. And then the camera, well, the camera didn't stop, right? The camera just went, like, you know, traveling like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, okay? And then she stopped the clip and she said, I know that all of you did your fixation, right? <laughs> fixation she mentioned before. In, the, in that pair of tennis shoes. And I was there, and I promise I didn't see the tennis shoes. So for me, all this thing about the eye tracking is, you know, is this a bit, I don't know how to say that, because if you've done a, I mean, a very good job, and, and I really, uh, I think that this is fascinating what you've done, but really, can we take for granted that when we fix our eyes or look or whatever on the screen, we are reading or even we are watching what we are supposed to watch. So for me, for me it was shocking because all, I mean the rest of Dr. Herrera's talk was about this pair of, of tennis shoes that I hadn't been able to, to see. So I said, okay, I mean she's figuring that everyone has seen this pair of shoes. And uh, then I asked other colleagues in the room, and some of them, like me, they, 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 they didn't see the, the, the tennis shoes at all. So, to what extent can we take for granted that when we are watching an image, we are really understanding the image, or just, I don't know, uh, uh, when we're reading a subtitle, we're watching a subtitle, we're reading this subtitle. That's a difficult one as well, right? And then the final thing about ethics, and I'm sorry if I lost you. Sorry if I lost you. Ethics. <laughs> uh, Frank Sabin is presented here as a non conservative activity, free from capitalist forces, as a means of translators' empowerment, mm -hmm. and I think. That you write and you give many reasons, right? I'm not reading them all, I've got them here, right? And you cite Perez Gonzalez, uh, whose book was published after you printed your thesis, I guess, in 2014. Uh, yes, no. Which one? The uh, visual translation series methods and. Uh, if you don't, I think. Ah, yes. Okay. You cite this previous article, yes. right? And that's what I guess as well. But that's true. <laughs> but I think that it's already true that one, this is an unpaid activity. So uh, in that case, I don't think if it is a really non-conservative activity or really it's the, uh, again the, the, the same old story. Sometimes it is good for distributors, fun studying and fun dying as well, because their product is introduced in the target culture. And then it calls the attention of potential cinema goers. So in a way, they sort of, I mean, we, we know it's illegal, right? We know it's illegal, but and they do know that it's illegal as well. But in the case of Poland, for example, it's banned. But in the case of Spain, up to now, we don't know any uh, fan server going to prison or, or paying fines, you know, you know what? No, but no. Okay. Okay. So what I mean is that sometimes the speakers, you know, uh, don't mind, <laughs> or, or or they do, or they really do mind, and they say, okay, it's good for us in a way. So in a way, fan servers are, 
in the side of the cylinders, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? And then uh, you compare it to NGO practices in, 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 in a chapter of the thesis, I can't remember where now. But I'm not sure whether this comparison is, is sometimes it can be done with political or visual products, maybe. But some other times, I'm not sure whether they you know, fulfill the same um, function as NGO free translations do. Sorry, I was really wrong. Anyway, congratulations for your thesis, for your originality, the significant contribution to scholarship in the area of audiovisual translation. I really, I did really like your thesis. Uh, the analysis of counseling, its focus on perception, the methodological tools, the theoretical framework, and everything. Uh, for me, it was really a pleasure to read it and to learn uh, from your thesis. Thanks. Okay. It's your turn now. Okay, so for the recaptures and I revised that. And actually, recaptures, I started doing this argument because I used it for a talk some years ago. But then recapture has been changing, and now they yeah. don't use that text as much as they did, and you okay. have other ways of logging in. So that was one of the of the of the changes, and that's why this doesn't necessarily apply. And it also depends on where you go in, on the yeah. internet, yeah. where they need security or not, or YouTube. <laughs> so yes, it depends on, on the TVs. Yeah, would be depend on that. Uh, I'll change the HBO Go reference. Once again, I've been changing it since last year <laughs> because every time they make an announcement and do something new. Mm. I do I don't mention the transcreation pro practices and that is true, I leave this out. And uh, it's also the case that it's a different practice. Uh, it, it belongs to this international distribution system, but it's an answer by powerful industries such as the Indian industry that is strong and can actually take the content and adapt it. But for many countries, that is not a possibility. Russia does the same. Russia produced Liban theory actually legally. They just create a new version of it without paying any kind of copyright or loyalties or anything. So it's most in this, <coughs> uh, let's say, economically solvent countries where they can actually create this transcription practices. And I think it, a reference to that should be actually included to complement the view in the, in the first chapter when I'm talking about that. Mm. Although this case, this transcription process is mostly a result possibly from the interest that all this is happening in international products. So it's an official result by, result by the distributors and the creators of content who want to um, keep their users happy because they want to have access to this type of products because that's what they are demanding. So and I think it, it complements, it, it's, um, it's another way of answering to the needs of the users, the needs that users have created, and I think it will complement the discussion in, in chapter two, the background chapter. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll add that. Mm. In the discussion of the walkarounds, what I meant was that uh, you can see newspapers uh, distributing news about the what is happening in the U.S. industry because even if the film is going to be distributed in Spain in one month, users and viewers already know about this film. So it's not that the reporters as such have these walkarounds to find the content, but as they assume that the readers will have access to this content, they feel the need to report it. It's not that them, uh, they are the ones who are accessing the content, but that they recognize that people have access to this content. So they cannot follow the national distribution schedule, but have to adjust to the uh, local distribution schedule of the United States. But I think I can actually clarify that in the discussion then, as well as the geographical problems in the case of China and North Korea. Mm. Now, talking about functionalism and why um, I don't think it fits. Basically, when looking at uh, funds of and non-professional subtitling companies, in, in your case, for instance, you would phone someone to ask if you should this or that. 
in, in these new systems and in these groups, it is the people who identify themselves as users and at the same time are producing the content for someone they imagine that has a similar needs to theirs. So is it, my difference here is that it's the same person on both sides of the equation. So there is not a communication going from one side to the other, but rather this internal decision making process, say, uh, if one person or a group of people making the decisions together about what they think people will like them uh, will do and they do this because they have the power that languages and technological tools give them so although I think that functionalism can apply to some extent to the phenomenon I think this combination of roles in one person that has significantly more power than others in, in the equation cannot fully be explained by, by this traditional system. So that's more my, my view. Uh, but that doesn't only apply for translation, but also for, this, for photography or journalism, where people are taking these roles and are constantly moving from the professional to the non-professional side, sides, and uh, social journalism, for instance, is questioning what uh, journalism should be, if there should be editors or not. So it's a, a phenomenon that I think accounts for other things, new things that we cannot really fit uh, in the roles that we have defined in previous years. Mm, because we don't have this movement from one to the other in terms of the people involved. Uh, and that also relates to the fact that fan solving uh, cannot be necessarily seen as uh, this discussion between domestication or foreignization because that is not always the case in, at the same time. Really. In, there are screen cases of foreignization, like in Japanese anime, but there are also screen cases of uh, domestication. The Dicky, the Dicky thing. Yes, yes. And, and, they, and there are also middle points in which the needs of the uh, users of the uh, target audience of each uh, product are covered in a different way, but still remain somehow loyal to the source. So this discussion, there's some... I, I think most cases would be able to would be, it would be possible to explain in most cases what this uh, duality between uh, the foreign and the local but I also think that there, in between there is a range of options that we cannot really understand if we remain at this maybe polarity the thing is that I don't think either that this applies only for fan yeah. it applies for translation exactly. and that's the implications that I see of non-professional uh, subtitle because we are seeing people making more things and people who are not controlled by an outsider going back to the roles of the people involved so they are defining what they can do there is no one telling them this should be this way or that way so take, under those circumstances these people can take other options and then translation sites could look at those options and see what is going on there and how the balance of powers affects the translation. So it's not only about fan solving, but I think it's the entry to see how the structure of the translation profession practice is actually occurring. Because if you take out the monetary rewards as an element in the translation, there should be other aspects covering for it and taking other roles. So I, I think to find room for all these explanations, the best thing would be to see how we can understand it first and then how that differs from what we have already instead of just trying to take what we have and feed it in the previous models. And the definition of professional and crowdsourcing. Uh, actually, there was a section in this thesis that was going on and on about the differences in professional amateur subtitle and fan subbing, which was removed because it was too long and I was already reaching the limit. <laughs> But um, there is a, an image that could help us. It's still under development, but I think it could help me make my point here. Um, yeah, you can see her sourcing there. But where is it? Uh, down there. Ah, yes. So, uh, but this is not. No, this is not. Please go back to the Gosser. Just tell us. Uh, 
Yeah. What? And lunchtime. It was a comment. So, um, non professional subtitling for me is a type of uh, uncommissioned, unpaid translation. So, it's the, uh, going back to the discussion uh, before, is the, it's the representation of the case in which people are uh, translating content that is not requested by anyone and are not re uh, receiving any kind of monetary rewards or any kind of direct rewards for the content. While crowdsourcing, on the other hand, is controlled by a company, and normally people don't receive uh, any monetary rewards, although there are cases as Amazon, uh, Amazon Turk, uh, yes, in which people are uh, participating in crowdsourcing strategies and are being paid for, uh, are being paid for specific, uh, for the work they do. So, then we have the user generated, generated translation asset. Found. So okay. it's classified between paid and unpaid, then, but then user-generated translation can be commissioned or non-commissioned. And that's where I define draw the line between crowdsourcing and amateur subtitling. And then again, amateur subtitling is different from other aspects <coughs> of subtitling. Non-professional subtitling would be amateur subtitling, but also fun subbing and pro-amateur subtitling specifically, or even innovative subtitling. So that's how I see the distinctions here. And, and that's why I use I go for non-professional subtitling as one of the umbrella terms, and I do agree with the fact that the classification by Gambia is different because he uses different layers of understanding. And at some point, he draws lines using technological tools as tools as classification, then working strategies as a way of classification, and then the people involved to express a way of classification. So the system overlaps in more than one case and it's very confusing. Mm. Now, hypothesis two, was it necessary? Uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 uh, but actually you gave me the answer to that question. Because you didn't notice the shoes in Pilar's presentation. I think it's necessary because we cannot assume that everyone watches the content in the same way. I think by uh, we have seen with my response that the people in the low level of English follow a um, more similar approach because they are dependent on the subtitles. But people in the high level of English who can depend or not on the subtitles can differ in the way that they approach subtitling. And that can tell us that we can create subtitles according to different needs depending on what people really want. So even if it's straightforward, it's evident that people will uh, relate different with the, to the subtitles. There are reasons to, at least now we can, if you want to, not look at the people with the low level of English, because for them, the language scale, the linguistic scale is the one that uh, indicates how they will read the subtitles. But with the people for the high level of English now, we can see that there are other elements that are also indicating and changing the way how they engage with the content. So that's why. One of the reasons why I think it's valid because not everyone looks at the subtitles and not everyone looks at the shoes. So if we can uh, arrange for that and show uh, with empirical data that people do that, uh, we can start a discussion. And also because uh, to some extent this uh, challenges the fact that we assume that everyone, everyone basically reads the subtitle by default. That is an automated task. There is a degree of automation there because there's something new on the screen and you can uh, go there because, uh, because of the impression that you get. But there are also people now who are able to decide when to go to the subtitle area and do that in a more or less conscious manner because they have specific needs. So I think the exploration of that is possible in this case thanks to the fact that I included the second sub hypothesis and the, I was able to tell the two weeks apart. Can you rephrase the hypothesis according to that? After, yes, now based on the, on the findings, I think so. And also, uh, the hypothesis initially wasn't there. The hypothesis was part of the development of the code. Once I, I was going to focus mostly on the subtitles, but then after the data was collected, uh, it was evident that there was something going on there with the language scales. And up to my knowledge, I don't think we have used type tracking to see how people with different levels of uh, proficiency in the source language and uh, engage with the content. We know that there are differences because there are studies without uh, eye tracking that indicate that, but we don't know how that really affects the participants at a cognitive level. So 
that was the type of approach we wanted to take with the second hypothesis. And, this, and now the aspects of ethics and the legality of fans solving. If I, I, if the, well, the question was that I think that between the lines, I, I grasp that you are in favor of, of fansubbing because it's a non-conservative practice because uh, it's like, uh, I don't know, like, like challenging market forces, and challenging capital establishment and capitalism and so on and so forth. And in my view, maybe it is part of two, but maybe it's not. Uh, so true because it's a daily activity, because it helps the distributors, and because it, I think it is not exactly the same case as NGO activities yes. translation. What's your opinion? It's uh, the problem with France is that it goes down to the fact that each country has different law enforcement and that uh, this is an international phenomenon. And what I was saying before, the difference between the fans of in the 80s that was going against capitalism and the control exerted by the United States, but then had in the distribution of the visual content, uh, that uh, puts this discussion into a very complicate, complicated area because there are not, you cannot have a, um, just one position regarding fans of It changes depending on each country, on each. Um, on each situation. There was a case, for instance, of the fan solvers in Sweden going on a strike. So in that sense, is this illegal practice is acquiring the rights or the uh, taking on the possibility that unpaid people have basically because they are performing a task. So it is the case that uh, there are different approaches. In fact, in Spain, the, one of the groups I use is Grupo TS. It was first two series. It actually changed because when they announced the lay syndic, uh, they contacted the administrator of this group saying that they were going to, uh, that she herself should identify as the owner of the group and should go to, should take responsibility for what the group was doing. So that's why the group was shut down for some time and then reopened with a new name. So there are different countries trying to enforce law in different aspects. In Sweden and in Poland it has happened that they have prosecuted fan solvers. Mm, in other countries the conditions are more relaxed. Then again, it's uh, even if they do it here in Spain, the Spanish shop tires produced in Latin America can still travel. That's not necessarily a problem and you can translate regardless of your geographical location. So the conditions of legality here are, are quite tricky. On top of that, one of the problems is that the law doesn't really cover these kind of practices. And that the practices change, change so much that it is very difficult to the law, for the law to catch up with what is really happening. What's happening with fans solving now is not the same that happened uh, with fans solving in the 80s. And the, the legal conditions in which they were operating are so different. That's one aspect of the law. And then the other is that, as you mentioned, some distributors are actually happy that it happens. Uh, three years ago, the, uh, one of the directors of H HBO said that it was good for Game of Thrones to be uh, distributed illegally in Australia because it shows how much, how much people was into the show. But then last year, they have started, uh, they started to think more about that and now are launching this HBO goal that basically tricks to reduce the room that people have for piracy by offering another possibility to access the content. So it's, it's always the circle. I, my position on uh, regarding the ethics here, I, is, I try to adjust to the law, and that's why I didn't include a DVD copy in the subtitle, because that's distribution of illegal content. Uh, ripping and distribution of illegal content. You can use academic words. Yes, but I didn't know if that would cover covered also the video or not, and that's why I try to explain here, but it's, mm, it's, it's still an issue, and it's very difficult to see where you should really legally stand in here, because even if the law goes one way, what they think about that is different after they reopen the group, but yes, nothing happens, and it's been operating ever since, for three years now. 
So uh, what was really behind this wish to shut down the group or asking the administrator to report and to um, show herself as the administrator and owner of the content. So it's, this is uh, the problem. Now the discussion of fund solving and NGO practices and this whole user-generated translation thing, it also changes from one person to the other. I was at a talk on NGO practices for in translation NGO practices in Barcelona and it was a professional translator talking and he was saying that basically because of the fact that these people were doing a, a work that was unpaid and taken from the work that other people would do and paid taxes on their rewards, on, the, on their income then they are basically affecting the economy of the country not the economy of the people so the position changes a lot and I think depending on who's having the argument uh, the, the stance of legal issue will be different. I try to do it as an academic just looking at the subtitles and how they affect the, the reception but it, the position could be also different. I try not to use the term illegal subtitles in the piece because, that, because of the same reason. I, I, I wouldn't say that for every situation this should be considered illegal. Okay, thanks. We could go on and on, but we have to stop. <laughs> anyway, would you like to add anything? Marine or Victor, would you like to add anything? Um, just to encourage you to keep working in this area. Um, and my last question about pushing the norms. I think that this is really interesting for translation and interpreting studies. These norms that have been established, maybe for commercial reasons, maybe for old technological reasons, might not have much to do with cognitive processing. And I think this work really gives us some insight. Thank you. Thanks. Would you like to add anything else? You're tired enough. <laughs> no, I think the cover of the questions <laughs> about <laughs> Okay, any uh, doctor in the room would like to add anything or to say anything? No, I have you know, right Of course. <laughs> so uh, the vice is. Very briefly, uh, my thanks to the All Star Graduation Committee for being here. Um, you didn't see the worst part of the thesis. The worst part of this research is he finished it and his social relationship with our department, <laughs> with our research group, with extended communities at Tarragona and Barcelona, students who are here for it, uh, ends officially, or we'll enter a new phase. Uh, David has been a, 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 a key element of our research group and community here uh, for the past few years, and he will be very sadly missed how it comes back. To the extent that this research is a product of the research group, my role in it is very, very reduced. Uh, David has won our prize, I think, for the most conferences attended in Europe over the past <laughs> few years. He's become a member of a research community that goes beyond Tarragona, Spain, and is indeed European and, and beyond. And uh, even details like, I remember the, the, the title of the thesis was a product of a brainstorming session among us all. Yes. Yeah, I think I suggested the one. We got there and then I said, I don't like it, I don't like it, and he did. Okay. Uh, so a lot of things that really belong to David and the community, the extended community, that he's become a part of. I think that's a model of the way research should be done. I would like to insist that what he's done is dynamite. And that's not obvious because of all the numbers and things. People assume that a non-professional activity is worse that professional activity, not so here or others. People assume that a product translated into Castilian Spanish is going to be more successful in Spain than something from Latin America, not so here or others. Okay? Oh, you good? I thought you were Yeah, people assume subtitles are only for people who have no English. Not so. People who have English also use them here or others. Methodologically, that's difficult because he's testing the null hypothesis. But in social terms, in relating to our environment, in getting people to think about this fresh and, and anew, it's been dynamite, as I said. David has had the power 
to go from large-scale hypotheses about globalization, localization, etc., the cultural studies type stuff, that's usually done on the basis of anecdotes and fun facts. Uh, he's also made us addicts to Game of Thrones over the last three years. Anyway, uh, and he's allied that cultural studies approach with hard empirical data. He's one of the very few researchers who have done that. That's innovative. It's something that our research group as, as a whole supports. And I sincerely hope he continues with that activity in the future. So my thanks, especially to the committee for the presence, and to David for the three years. Thank you very much. That's a few words. And now we have to ask you all to leave the room because we have to agree a bit. <laughs> After a thorough deliberation, uh, this panel has agreed unanimously to award the thesis entitled The Reception of Non-Professional Subtitling, submitted by David Ferro Carmona, the grade of, now in Catalan, excellent. Congratulations, David. <laughs> According to new regulations in Spain, we have to vote now uh, the cum laude thing, right? Uh, and we will do it uh, afterwards, right? And then uh, I think that on behalf of this panel, I want to congratulate you, uh, new grand doctor Orrego Carmona. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, okay.